Hey, Kimberly. Good morning and welcome to the worship of the Lord. Welcome to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're here on this beautiful Lord's Day morning. And we're especially glad if you're with us for the first time. A welcome in Christ's name. We hope this is an hour of worship that draws you closer to the living God. Well, you know, we're not here by chance. We're not even really here by our own pure volition, but God has called us. And so listen to the Lord's call to worship this morning. It's from Psalm 95. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Let's stand and praise our great God.
Isaiah 35, verse 3. Strengthen the 
weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, be strong and do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. He will come and save you. You guys can do me a, uh, a favor. Repeat after me. God is good and he is faithful now and forevermore. All right, let's do it together. God is good and he is faithful now and forevermore. Amen, amen. Let's sing together. Evan. All throughout my history Faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring He never sees me from where I'm standing Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, guardian of our souls, you have promised to watch over us and keep us from all harm. You have assured us again and again that nothing can separate us from your love. And we have indeed, indeed seen all over our lives 
the evidence of your goodness. And yet we worry about our troubles, real and imagined. We turn to created things for the help that you alone can give. We collapse when we should be strong and we prove to be poor witnesses for you. Oh Lord, forgive us of our sinful fear and worry. Send your Holy Spirit to enable us to rely upon you at all times. And may we remember that you have promised to be with us to the very end of the age. Amen. Well, let's remain standing and let's affirm our faith with believers around the world and through the ages with the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let me tell you some things that are going on in your church, things that are um, coming up quickly or even some things today. First of all, look at the back of your bulletin and I want to highlight a couple items. The beginning of our concert series, uh, uh, tickets are on sale for the concert, first concert, October 28th with David Phelps. Now, if you've never heard David Phelps, he is a fantastic tenor, sang for a number of years in the Gaither uh, Vocal Band. He's a Dove Award winner, a Grammy Award winner, um, outstanding singer. And so this is going to be a fantastic concert. My wife and I are going. We've bought uh, actually four tickets. If you are in your 20s or 30s, we have a young adult kickoff meal today in trivia. It's a lunch in Gangway after the second service at 1215. This will be a, a, a fun time with other uh, young adults your age. It'll be um, uh, uh, an explanation of some of the events that are coming up in our church this fall. If you have children here, it doesn't matter. This is a family-friendly event, and so you can bring your kids to it. And you may wonder, well, if I'm in this service, what am I going to do uh, afterwards and, until the, the lunch? Well, let me encourage you to consider going to one of our new Sunday school classes. And with that in mind, in the narthex, after this service, go out there, look at some of the tables, and you'll see some of the um, information on, on the new studies and groups and, um, and uh, Sunday school classes that we have this fall. We've got lots going on, something for everyone, and so uh, take note of that. You know, the Lord Jesus said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Uh, he also said, freely you have received, freely give. And what Jesus meant by that is that as believers, we've received God's grace, and one of the ways we express our gratitude to him is through our own giving. And so I want to encourage you to do that, to give generously to the ministry of this church. There are a number of ways you can do it. They're on the screen there. And also, since this is Communion Sunday, we always collect a special offering. It's the, the Deacon Benevolence Offering. And so at the doors will be deacons holding plates, and that money goes to uh, needs of those in our church family, those who have uh, special financial needs. Uh, finally, I want to just um, welcome you once again. If you're here for the first time, we're delighted that you're with us. We believe this is a divine appointment. And so before you leave today, Fill out that card that's in the pew, the welcome card. Just leave it on one of the tables in the back so that we'll know you're with us and we'll be able to contact you about things that are going on in our church. Well, let's give our attention to God's word and to our pastor. Thanks, Pastor Andrew. Uh, good morning, church. You know, I was thinking just this past week, and I know I've said this before, but this is the highlight of my week. And I pray it's the highlight of your week as well. I just love... Being here, worshiping with you, and witnessing together what God's doing through this church. And so what a privilege to be your pastor. 
And uh, what a privilege to gather together every week as we continue to witness uh, God's amazing grace and his amazing provision in the life of our church and ministry. We are looking uh, this morning at Judges chapter 16. I never thought I'd say that I, that I am having so much fun studying and preaching through the book of Judges. And I pray that you each week as we are looking at the book of Judges and looking at this cycle of deliverance that God provides through judges, through deliverers, I pray that you're seeing the relevance in your life, in our lives, in the life of our church, in the life of being a Christian in the 21st century. I pray that you're seeing that God's word truly is timeless, that it's living and active, that it's relevant today as it was thousands of years ago in the period of the Judges. Judges chapter 16, it's the great story of Samson and Delilah. Samson is the last judge uh, in the cycle of Judges for the people of God. So would you stand as we read God's word. We stand when we read God's word because we actually believe that God is speaking to us through his word. And when the king speaks, the people rise to their feet. To hear what the king has to say to his people. We'll look at uh, Judges chapter 16 verses 1 through 7 and then we'll skip ahead to verse 23 through 30. This is the word of the living God. Samson went to Gaza and there he saw a prostitute and he went into her. The Gazites were told Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we will kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, and pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah, and the lords of the Philistines came up to her. And said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies. And by what means we may overpower him and we will bind him to humble him. And we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. How sweet. Verse 7, Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dry, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Look at verse 23 with me. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country who has killed many of us. And when when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison. They entertained him and he entertained them. And they made him stand between the pillars. And Samson said to the young man who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests that I might lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. And on the roof there, there were about 3,000 men and women who looked on while Samson entertained. And Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested. He leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one, his left hand on the other, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed with all his strength, and the house fell upon the lords and upon the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those whom he had killed during his life. And the grass withers, and the flower continues to fade, but the word of our Lord It stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. 
I mean, Judges 16 has all of the elements of a TV miniseries, doesn't it? I mean, this is uh, sex, passion, seduction, bribery, murder. But the key to Scripture, the key to reading Scripture and studying Scripture is neither to worship the subjects, but it's also neither to condemn the subjects. Many people read and study Scripture, and they'll either elevate characters like Samson, or they'll condemn characters like Samson. We tend to read Scripture as a historical narrative only. Or maybe some of you read Scripture as if it was a work of antiquity. But I want to challenge you with this one thing this morning, that you would see yourself in the story of Samson, that you would see yourself in this story, that you would see as you read and study Judges 16 that the word is living and active, that this isn't just a word passed down to us throughout the ages, that we are simply to study and to familiarize ourselves with but we are to see ourselves in this story, that you would walk away from Judges 16 this morning saying, we are Samson. So let's study Judges 16 together this morning. How do we see ourselves in the story of Samson and Deliah, the story of Judges chapter 16? The first thing I think we see is our self-reliance. We see our natural self-reliance in the story of Samson and Delilah. And not only do we see our self-reliance, I hope you see the folly and the foolishness of our human nature to rely on ourselves. You see, in the opening verses that we read here in Judges 16, we see a man, an Israelite, Samson, who is captured by the Philistines and he's put in this house and the lords of the Philistines surround the house and they say, we will capture him. But what happens? Samson escapes and instead of Samson saying, the Lord will provide, I will depend on the Lord's strength, I will depend on the Lord's power, what does Samson do? He climbs the hill, he rips off the gates, and in a way of declaring his power and his competency and his strength, he declares, I will build my life and the gates of my reputation will prevail. And we do the same every day. You see, Samson here in verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 is a picture of all of us. It was Samson's way of communicating to the Philistines that I don't depend on my father's strength. I don't depend on my Lord's strength, but I depend on my strength and power. That was symbolic to show the Philistines, I will prevail. I am self-reliant. Look at my power and look at my strength. And if we are honest, we fall into this trap every single day where we climb the hill and we rip off the gates and we want to prove our strength and our competence and our self-reliance to our children and to our spouses and to our friends and to all of our followers on social media. Look at me. And in the story of Samson, we see the utter foolishness of self-reliance. We see a man that is dependent not upon the strength of God, but we see a man in the opening verses of chapter 16 that is fallen prey to the temptation of self-reliance. I mean, without fail, I mean, how many times do we watch a a sporting event or we hear somebody uh, interviewed after some great accomplishment, whether it's 
football or basketball or the Olympics, and you often hear people say, I've had a coach that always told me to believe in myself. Listen to what I'm about to say. That is a lie from the pit of hell, to believe in yourself. The creed of our culture and the creed of our society is for you to believe in yourself. If you are a Christian here today, your old self is worthy of being put to death. The old is gone and the new has come. There is nothing about your old self. There is nothing about your flesh and your human nature that you should believe in. It is the folly and the utter foolishness of self-reliance. Samson was not singing in his moment where he needed God. He was not singing, I am weak, but thou art strong. He was saying, I am strong. In his moment of desperation, was not looking to the strength of God, but was looking to his own strength. And we see this today, even in our own lives, in our society. The core value of our society is self-reliance. God helps those who help themselves. What verse is that in the Bible? Do you know 53% of the North American church thinks that's a verse in the Bible. God helps those who help themselves. Not a word in Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and 53% of the North American church thinks it's the very word of God. It is utter foolishness. The world says you must find yourself, you must be true to yourself, and above all, you must express yourself. And I'm here today to remind you that Jesus has a better pathway to life. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls on the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Therefore, whoever loves his life will lose it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. The message of Jesus, contrary to the message of this world, is do not believe in yourself. Believe in the one who came, who laid down his life for your wicked self so that you could ultimately find life and life to the full, both now and forever. Only the fool is self-reliant like Samson. All of the religions of the world say, believe in yourself. Christianity alone says, deny yourself. Pick up the cross and wholly lean on Jesus' name. We see in the life of Samson the human, the, the, our human nature and the gravitation to going to that awful place of relying on ourself. And I pray that as we grow in grace and as we grow in this journey of denying ourselves, that we would not gravitate to ourself, but we would die to our old self and embrace the new creation that we are in Jesus Christ. Second thing that we see in the life and the story of Samson is our longing to be satisfied. You see, Samson and Delilah is a story of two thirsty, empty souls that are longing to be satisfied. And as I've said before, there is nothing wrong with our longing to be satisfied. There's nothing wrong for our hunger to be satisfied and our thirst to be quenched. The problem is where do we go to find satisfaction? Where do we go to quench our thirsty souls? For Samson, it was sex. For Delilah, it was money and fame. 
Both of these individuals is a story of human nature longing to be satisfied by the things of this world. Whether there is sex or money or fame or fortune or a great reputation, these two individuals are a case study of longing to be satisfied in all of the things of this world. This is not a love story. This is two individuals using each other. Two empty, thirsty souls using each other to get something that only God can provide. And if we're honest, we fall prey. We fall into the temptation every single day of going to the wrong well, of going to broken cisterns to try to quench that thirst that only God can satisfy. And here's the application for us. If you do not quench your thirst at the well of Jesus, every relationship will be used and abused. Because you will use your spouse and your children and your friends and your uh, and brothers and sisters in Christ and your colleagues to get something that only God can provide. And so if we are not going daily to the source of the well of Jesus Christ to satisfy our thirsty souls, we will begin to look around at all of our relationships and they will all be relationships that we are using to gain for ourselves what only God can give us. And wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if our relationships were based on giving instead of taking? What if our relationships were defined by not what you give to me, I have everything I need in Jesus Christ, therefore I can give myself away to you. That my relationships weren't defined and revolved around using and abusing, but my relationships were defined on the freedom that I have in Christ so I can be a giver and not a taker. And until we understand that our souls will never be satisfied until we find the true source of satisfaction in the gospel of Jesus Christ, all of our relationships will begin to break down. Our marriages and our relationships with our kids. Because you will always say, I need you to give me affirmation. I need affirmation from my kids, and I need affirmation from my spouse, and I need affirmation on social media, and I need affirmation from my colleagues at work. And I'm here to say, no, you don't. If you are a Christian, you have all the affirmation you need in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our longing to be satisfied is good. God created us this way. But he created us to find our satisfaction alone in his finished work on our behalf. The good news for the Christian is that you don't have to drink from broken cisterns, but that you can drink from the well of living water that springs up to everlasting life and live by the promise of Jesus Christ that the water that I give you will never leave you thirsty again. Our longing, longing to be satisfied, our propensity to look to ourselves and to rely on ourselves. And third and lastly, how do we see ourselves in the story of Samson and Delilah, our desperate need for grace? At the end of the day, the story of Samson and Delilah as captured here in Judges 16 reminds us yet again of God's story of amazing grace. In verse 23, we read that Samson is eventually captured and bound and blinded and brought to the temple of the Philistine god Dagon for their amusement. But in verse 23... We're told that Samson, I'm sorry, in verse 28, we're told that Samson finally breaks this soul-thirsty, self-reliant man. In verse 28, finally breaks, bound and blinded and dancing around for the amusement of the Philistines. Finally, what does it say in verse 28? Then Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me this once, O God. It is in this moment that we see 
that the reality that Samson can't save himself, but only God can. It's the reminder that he is desperate for the grace and mercy of God, that it brings him to his knees, that my strength won't save me, that my power and my competence won't save me, but only the grace of God will save me in this moment. And it's the grace of God that brings Samson to his knees and allows him to cry out to God even from the temple of Dagon. What a great reminder for us that we are never so far from the grace of God that we can even cry out to him from Dagon's temple. You might be here this morning and you are so far from God. You might be here this morning and going, I don't even know how I got here. But you find yourself this morning in Dagon's temple, far removed from God, far removed from sensing his ple pleasure and his presence. And the good news this morning is that when we fall to our knees, no matter how far we've gone, no matter how far we've run, when we fall to our knees in desperation, we too can cry out. Yes, we can cry out even from Dagon's temple. Do you know him? Do you know this God? This God who offers his amazing grace to us. It was the desperation, it was the desperation of Samson realizing nothing else will do and nothing else will save. And nothing else will give me hope other than the amazing grace of God. I said earlier in this message that I want you to see something important in this passage. I want you to see yourself in the story of Judges 16. But there's something in someone else more important that I want you to see than yourself. You see, the story of Judges 16 not only reveals our true self, but the story of Judges 16 reveals the need for a greater judge. Judges 16 reveals the need for a greater deliverer. And the story of Judges 16 points us ultimately to the one that would come thousands of years later. A greater judge by the name of Jesus Christ would come. And Jesus wasn't blinded, but he was blindfolded. Jesus was turned over to the Gentiles to hang on a cross and it would be through his death that wouldn't destroy 3,000 people. But it would be through Jesus Christ's death that would destroy the great enemy of the people of God once and for all. The great enemy of sin and death. Yes, it is in Jesus Christ that the great judge and deliverer of the world has come. And it was the reality for Samson that I can't but he can, and him placing his faith in a future judge and a future deliverer that we know today is the person of Jesus Christ. That I pray that you today, if you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, what are you waiting for? That there is no hope, there is no deliverance, there is no salvation apart from Jesus Christ. For Paul declares that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from sin. Saved from death. Saved from the lie of self-reliance. And that would transform you into someone that falls to their knees. Even from Dagon's temple. And cries out for deliverance. Jerry was a quadriplegic. He was a high school football star in Nebraska. And during the state championship, he broke his neck. Later on in life, he surrendered his life to Jesus. He became a teacher. And one of the things Jerry talks, talked about in his testimony is he would always lament high school graduation. Because speaker after speaker after speaker would challenge the student body, just believe in yourself. 
Jerry, confined to a wheelchair, said, how in the world can I believe in myself? One day in the classroom as he was teaching his students, he got so excited that he actually fell out of his wheelchair. And he said, in that moment, no matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I wanted to, there was nothing in the world that would ever get me up off this ground. And I'm here today to remind you, there's nothing that can get you up off the ground either, except for the salvation and the deliverance of God through the person of Jesus Christ. Christianity alone offers us a father that through Jesus Christ alone, we can call out to him in our moment and need of deliverance. And he alone, by his grace, according to his power and strength and not ours, can deliver you. So in our journey, in this long journey towards utter dependence, in Jesus Christ alone, I leave you with this. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise and forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer, because in his arms he'll take and shield you, and you will find a solace there. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, I thank you for the timeless, living word of God that speaks truth to us even today, that we would see through the story of Samson and Delilah our self-reliance, our longing to be satisfied, but in the end, our desperate need for the amazing grace of God. We are desperate people. And remind us yet again today that you alone save, that you alone deliver, that you alone rescue, that contrary to the values and the creeds of this world, we are to deny ourselves, to lose our life in order to find it. May that be made more of a reality in our lives as Christians. May we continue every single day to deny ourselves, take up the cross and follow you. That's where life is found. That we wouldn't buy the lies of this world to look to ourselves, our power, our strength, our competence, but may we look to Jesus and him alone. That's where life is found. Maybe you're a teenager here today. Don't buy the lie of this world to believe in yourself, but embrace the truth that our only hope is found in believing in Jesus Christ. There's salvation there. And for anyone here today, or anyone listening at home, that has been trying to rescue themselves like Samson originally was, if there's anyone here today that finds themselves in Dagon's temple and doesn't know how they could ever get out and doesn't know how they could ever experience the favor and love of God, I pray that you would break them. Break them of the lie that salvation is not possible. Break them of the lie that God's grace can't be extended to them. If you're one of those people, would you cry out, ask for forgiveness, ask for forgiveness for, for your sin, recognizing that Jesus alone offers complete forgiveness, the removal of shame and condemnation, and offers himself freely. So that today you can believe and be saved. You can experience what, the, what, what people have been experiencing for thousands of years. Death to self and new life in Christ. You can be born again, forgetting the past and looking forward by faith to life eternal. Life to the full, both now and forever, found only in Jesus Christ. Would you look to him today, surrender your life 
and become a child of God. You came in a sinner and an orphan, and you could leave here today as a son and daughter of God because of Jesus Christ. And the testimony this day, be many came, many, many came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Well, we have the privilege this morning and the joy of celebrating communion together, the Lord's table. And as we've been reminded in this sermon, our hearts are indeed uh, insatiable. We desire many things as sinners, and yet uh, Jesus offers us something very simple and something profoundly satisfying. And here's the way he puts it in the book of Revelation. He says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Uh, isn't that a profound uh, blessing and, and presentation? Jesus says, here's what I offer you. I offer you um, a fellowship meal. Uh, not all of the fancy and extravagant things the world offers, but uh, meet with me at my table and enjoy fellowship with me. And that's what this table is. That's why we call it communion, because we commune with the living Lord Jesus as we eat and drink at this table. Now, you may say, well, uh, isn't Jesus with us everywhere? Um, isn't, isn't he with me uh, uh, no matter where I am? Certainly he is. Uh, Jesus is omnipresent. He's always with us. And yet the Bible says that he draws close to his people at certain key places and times. And one of those is at the Lord's table. We're going to be partaking this morning with these little cups. If you did not get one and uh, need one, please raise your hand and the ushers will come and, and uh, give you one. This meal, this table is for God's people. We call it the Lord's table. It's not the Presbyterian table. It's not the table of Coleridge Church. But this is the Lord's table and it's for all of you who've professed your faith in Jesus Christ and who are members in good standing of a church that preaches the gospel. So if that's true of you, then I invite you to uh, eat and drink with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray and ask him to bless this meal. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for your perfect life, for your death, for your resurrection, for your ascension into heaven, for your present reign over all things, and for your promise to come again. And we thank you for this tremendous gift, this conduit of your grace, the Lord's table. We pray that as we eat this bread and drink this cup in faith, that the Holy Spirit will apply them to our hearts and that we will indeed commune with you. Uh, we know that we might not feel anything different or special, but we believe in this spiritual reality that you are with your people around this table. And so we pray that you would use it to satisfy the deep hungers and desires of our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread, and when he had blessed it, giving thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Amen. And after supper, our Savior took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Drink from it, all of you. stand and give thanks to God for his blessings in Christ. And before we sing, I receive the Lord's benediction. May the God of peace, who brought again from the grave our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us at Coral Ridge. We are a gospel-centered church that equips culture-shaping Christians. For more information on the church, our studies, and upcoming events and live streams, visit crpc.org or download the Coral Ridge app available now in the App Store. To give to the ministry here at Coral Ridge, visit crpc.org slash give. You can also mail checks to the address below. From wherever you're watching, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. 